All right, well, uh, this is a special evening for the RESC because a very good friend of all of us uh, has chosen to write his biography and has allowed the RESC to publish it. And uh, this is, I think, a first. Uh, and I'd like, to, I'd like to see us do more of these, um, uh, publish uh, more books on Canadian history and especially Canadians, uh, astronomers and, and uh, people that have affected, uh, affected the, uh, the hot, not only the hobby, but the science. Um, so you all know that David Levy is, uh, is our special guest tonight. His book, A Night Watchman's Journey, um, is, uh, is now for sale. And uh, I th when did we start talking about this? You got to use your microphone. <coughs> it was at a GA somewhere. What GA was it? It was the London one. London, London yeah. GA. Okay, well, I think we were in line about for two the... two or three years ago. Yeah, we were in line for the barbecue or something and we started talking about it. So, um, and I said, yeah, we should, uh, we should publish that. So I said, uh, write it and, uh, you know, if it's any good, we'll... <laughs> So, well, what um, if it isn't any good? <laughs> it is. It's very good. And uh, so we thought tonight would be a great opportunity to uh, essentially kick it off. What is, what is the official term for a book? Launch. Oh, a launch. I should know that. <laughs> it launches, then it comes back and lands. Okay. Um, so that's what we're doing. Um, I think, since it's a biography, I don't think I have to do a biography and introduce David. I think you're just going to cover that, so that's good. Um, but I think uh, you should know that David, you know, grew up in Montreal, but moved down to Arizona, uh, I'm told, in 1980, uh, because the skies are somewhat better down there. So that's a serious astronomer to actually go to another country. And, uh, you know, so... But it obviously, as we'll see, it... Sometimes uh, one wonders why I moved <laughs> to another country. Well, you seem to have got, it seemed to have worked out for you. Uh, so we thought the format might be kind of nice to have uh, uh, David be uh, interviewed uh, about the book. And then David will do some readings from the book. Uh, so I asked uh, our good friend Ivan Semenik from uh, the Globe and Mail to, uh, to come and, uh, and interview David, he's done this before, and he you know does an awesome job, and uh, he probably has some memories of uh, 1994 and Comet Levy and uh, Shoemaker Levy and and uh, and other things. Uh, but as as you know, um, he reports in science in uh, the Globe and Mail, and is a great friend of the RESC, and he's a contributing editor to the Sky News magazine. And uh, he's a uh, host of an astronomy television series called Com Cosmic Vistas, which were made like decades ago, but they're still playing them every weekend. So that's pretty cool. I hope you get a lot of... Okay, he gets nothing. <laughs> but I get the satisfaction. Yes. Well, they're, they're excellent. So if you haven't seen them, look, look for them on the Discovery Channel. Oh, then, all right. So, it, yeah, so it, it, Gary is in it as well. <laughs> So please welcome David Levy and Ivan Semenik. <clears throat> David, great to see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many friends, so many familiar faces. Uh, thanks. I hope you're having a wonderful conference. And uh, of course, I was just looking at the program and kind of wishing I was been here or could be here all, all for the next couple of days. Uh, so uh, Randy's absolutely right. I have memories kind of flooding. Of, of course, this is, we know that this is the, fifth, the year of the 50th anniversary. Well, we're all hearing about the 50th anniversary of Apollo. But yeah, I was thinking about kind of halfway back that time, <laughs> 25 years ago this summer. And in fact, I have a very specific memory of you, David, and I'm sure this is probably the first time I met you because uh, at the time I was working at the Ontario Science Center, we brought you to come speak at the science, uh. Yes, we were both a lot younger. Yes, yes. And I just, what, what I remember is, uh, uh, you know, the week that everything was happening uh, and the fragments of Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 were smacking into Jupiter uh, uh, and leaving these incredibly 
uh, vivid marks uh, in the atmosphere of the planet going out on the Danforth, after we'd done a program at the Ontario Science Centre, going out on the Danforth and actually uh, setting up, uh, John Ginder was there, set up a little six inch telescope and right there on the Danforth we were looking at and we could see spots. Uh, it was that easy to see in the middle of Toronto with a six inch reflecting telescope. Uh, and you know, I think I, not long after that, had a chance to tell you about that story. But uh, I mean, you must, with this 25th anniversary coming up, must be reliving all of these memories. And I wanted to ask you two things, which is, you know, th that was kind of a, a pivotal point for you, clearly, when those the fragments of a comet that you'd helped discover were observed, you know, crashing into the largest planet in the solar system. I want to ask you what, looking back 25 years, what do you think changed for science, for astronomy at that point, and what changed for you? This is, this is, we're now about 20, we're almost exactly 25 years since the impacts of Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 on Jupiter. SL9 was not a famous comet because of what it was. It was a famous comet for what it did. It collided with Jupiter, and it was just as if the 20 odd pieces of the comet had stopped and said, listen, we are gonna give you Earthlings a lesson on how life can get seeded on a planet. And all you have to do is watch. You don't have to launch a mission, you don't have to take notes, you can take pictures. You can do anything you want, but all you need to do is watch. And that is precisely what we did. It was an amazing week. And uh, I remember being, given, being asked a question very much like yours just uh, before, and uh, you know, by, a, by a reporter. And I felt, I felt it was running for a political office of some sort. And I said, I have to have a uh, cover story here. <clears throat> what if nothing happens? And, uh, you know, the, the comets, the large pieces go whoop, and uh, nothing. You don't see a thing, not a darn thing. Well, we were alive the first time in the history of civilization when a comet collided with a planet. We didn't see anything, but we saw that it happened. That is not what happened. We saw a lot of things. And I remember the first night when we were at uh, NASA headquarters uh, having a conference, press conference, and they were trying to show us how to sit so that our jacket wouldn't be frumbled and all these crazy things, and I wouldn't look like an idiot, and uh, which, I, which, which is almost impossible with me anyway, not to look like an idiot. But anyway, uh, while we're doing this, um, somebody came in from the back, one of the scientists came in from the back, Bill Weaver, and uh, with a piece of paper. And he walked down and gave the piece of paper to Gene Shoemaker. And Gene just looked at it. And you know, in the book I say that people yell, they scream, they swear, but they never, ever blurt. That's not the word you use to describe what somebody is saying. But there's only one word to describe what Gene did at that moment. He had to blurt. <laughs> and he just stood up in his chair, he said, they saw plumes? <laughs> and we just, everybody just got up and we, they found us a computer so we could check email. And we were, we were seeing reports from Antarctica, from, from Spain, from all coming in from all over the world. And uh, then we had the press conference that night and, uh, and um, Heidi Hamill came in with pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope that were absolutely outstanding. The second part of your question is what does it do to me? Shoemaker-Levy 9 was like a train, and I love trains, and, uh, but it was like a train with about 20 cars on it, and two of those cars grabbed Gene and Carolyn and me, and they took us for a ride around Jupiter for a couple of years. And it was almost without warning, because here we are observing the sky, and enjoying the night sky and uh, doing our work with the 18-inch Schmidt. And all of a sudden, uh, Carolyn, this is during the day before, before, um, before we're actually observing that night and it was getting cloudy and Carolyn was scanning and suddenly she says, I don't know what I've got, but it looks like a squashed comet. 
And I thought she was joking. I thought she was telling a joke. Jean got up and took a look. And while Jean was looking, I looked up at Carolyn and I said, you are joking, aren't you? And she said, uh-uh. I had to take a look at this. <coughs> and I went and I looked through the stereo microscope and I saw the long dust trails on either side and the tails coming out and uh, going to the top of the, toward the top of the film and I absolutely couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen in all the years I was observing. And uh, I also remember <coughs> uh, telling Jean that I was going to ask Jim Scotty, a friend of mine, to confirm it for us. And uh, we had had a little issue with Jim's boss a few months earlier, and Jean was a little shy about asking Jim to confirm it. And we went back and forth a minute, and Carolyn wasn't saying much, and then I said, Jean, unless you tell me not to, I'm going to call Jim. And Jean said, do it. And I called him, and he said, well, it's a, it's a reflection. I said, are you sure? And he said, no, I'm not sure, but I think it's a reflection. And uh, he said, I'm very busy right now, but if I have the time, I'll take a look. A couple of hours later, after we had measured the positions of the comet, uh, I called Gene back, and he picks up the phone and goes, whoa. And I said, Jim, is that you? He says, uh-huh. I said, are you OK, Jim? He said, yeah. He said, the sound you just heard is me trying to pick my jaw off the floor. I said, do we have a comet? He says, my God, do you guys have a comet? It's the strangest thing I've ever seen. And he said that it, the way the CCD image read out was from the side, from the left side. And he said, the first thing I saw was what looked like a comet tail, but it wasn't getting any brighter as it got closer to the head. Then came the head and the tail of one of the fragments. Then it kept on reading out, and there was another and another and another. This is when J Jim just lost it. And then he got to the end, and then the trail on the other side. And, uh, and uh, what it did to me is that uh, it actually kind of gave some meaning to what I was doing. Because when I decided I was going to start to search for comets, and the picture on the back cover of the book actually has Pollux and Castor in it. I started searching on December the 17th, 1965, and uh, I chose the area of the sky between po Pollux and Castor. Uh, just a little thing I could go through in about five or 10 minutes, and considering the weather that night, that's about all the time I had, but that was 52 years ago, and just about three nights ago, I searched again between Pollux and Castor. It has utterly changed my life. That's the short answer to your very good qu first question. It's utterly changed your life, and yet, as you say, three nights ago, you're doing the same thing you were doing in 1965. And in fact, in the book, I noted that uh, uh, between the time uh, that you made that first search between Castor and Pollux and the time that you found your first comet, as you write, it took uh, 917 hours and 37 minutes. So I was... My God, you didn't get it right. It was 28 minutes. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but uh, so how did you know... Uh, how, how, where did that figure come? How do you know that figure to such precision? Well, I keep a track of how often, how often I search and the amount of time. And I kept them all in a, in a book, which I still have. I didn't bring that particular record book with me, but I believe it's online at the RASC website. You can, you can see the whole thing in my entire comet hunting records. But I had the uh, idea that I was gonna write record down where I was searching and uh, when I was searching, the telescope I was using. Not so much that I would get bored and not wanna do it anymore, but just enough so that I'd be able to go back and know what I was doing. And I didn't know what I was doing, boys and girls. I, I, uh, I, when I decided to start the search, I thought, well, searching for comets is easy. Any, any jerk can do that. Finding one, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> so my initial goal, it's not that funny. My initial goal was, my initial goal was, uh, was, was that I was, did not actually say 
that I should find a comet. It's, uh, the initial goal was to search for comets. The second goal was eventually to find a comet or a nova. And the third one was to embark on a study program so I could learn as much as possible about comets. And that actually ended up with my PhD at the Hebrew University, which was a very happy part of this whole thing. Right. And, and those three goals, that started back in 65? The whole kit and caboodle started on December 17, 1965. I have made, you're looking at somebody who has made some pretty awful decisions in his life, but I've made two good ones. The first good decision was that I married Wendy. And I think everyone here who knows Wendy, has met Wendy, will agree with that. Because <clears throat> I'd be in the tall grass without her. The second good decision was to, was to start searching for comets in 1965. And that is something I still do. I'm still passionate about it. And I'm not the sharpest tool in the box by any, any stretch of the imagination. But I don't know of anyone who is more passionate about the night sky than I am and he's going to continue doing this as long as he can. Not to find a comet, but just to search, just to look out there, to look at the sky. I'd love to have you set the scene for us, especially for people maybe who uh, want to do some catching up with you and imagining what this search is like today. You were saying you were just observing a few nights ago. What's a night in the life like for David Levy these days? Can you paint a picture for us? Yeah, I have the observing sessions tend to start like at say right this time of year around eight o'clock at night 20 hours <coughs> i think peter would like the way i mentioned the time that's that, that way and they go on till about 0200 or something like that but after that i write down int meaning intermittent because in between the time i start observing the time i end observing i'm inside watching television with wendy i go to the uh to my little uh, man cave uh, after Wendy gets to sleep and I'm watching a movie of some sort. But at some time, at, at some point, I will tell Wendy that I'm going out to do some observing. And I'll do an hour of comet searching. And then I have either my cell phone with the timer is on, and uh, it times me up to an hour or so, as, as long as I want to do it. And uh, once that's done, then I'll uh, go in and sometimes I'm, I have a remote telescope I have access, I'm fortunate enough to have access to. Uh, just before I left on a trip before this one, the telescope broke, so I thought I would no longer have access to it. But the friend that I'm borrowing it from did not decide not to have me as a friend. And he did not decide that I wasn't allowed to use a telescope. He said, oh, I know what the problem is. It's ACP, that program that we use, is kind of flaky from time to time, and you have to just set it a little more with another program ahead of time, and that'll fix it. And I say, oh, and that's what I've been doing. And, I, and that's where I do my variable stars. It's really part of my comet search, uh, this particular star, but once I got really busy into comet searching, I had to stop to reduce the amount of variable stars I was doing. How many AAVSO members are in the audience tonight? Oh, there are a few. Wow. That's over that section over there. <coughs> Okay, anyway, uh, I got, I started observing uh, a lot of variables in past decades, but once I got really going on comets, I had to drop the variable stars a lot. And I decided to drop, especially when I started to get successful at comet hunting, decided to drop to one variable star. And that is TV Corvi, which is, I call Clyde Tombaugh's star after the discovery of it. And uh, I use this remote telescope to observe it every night and then to search for comets in the fields around that star. And now it's up in a perfect part of the sky where I can do it. And as soon as I get home Monday or, or Tuesday, I will be doing that again right. with that. So, you know, you're down there in Arizona, and how, I have to ask you, how close is it, uh, where roughly in Arizona, how close are you to the border? What, uh, what's it like to be working, I mean, you've been there for years now, but uh, what's it like to be doing this work, kind of living almost like this alternate, like out of sync life with other people around you, uh, because you're obviously spending a lot of time, a lot of late hours, uh, and, you know, 
what do the neighbors think, or how, 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 does it, how does it work? Can I answer that question with a question? Yes. Uh, what actually got you started in astronomy? The real thing, and I keep on giving a story or two, but that's nonsense. Mm -hmm. The real thing is that I was, as a kid, very shy. It was very hard for me to make friends. I would lose them quickly and I would make them slowly. And uh, it was very, very hard. In fact, the friends of mine in the audience will know that because they never talk to me anymore. But anyway, um, of course now I have a lot of good friends and uh, I've made a lot of good friends, most of whom are amateur astronomers. But uh, I was very, very difficult for me to make friends as a kid. And uh, by getting into astronomy, I didn't need to have friends. I could do it all by myself. And that might be the real reason that I got into astronomy. Of course, since then, I found astronomy itself was so fascinating and so wonderful. And of course, getting into astronomy the same week got me into the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Incidentally, I'm going to be giving a talk this summer at our retreat called Why I Hate the RASC. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it so much that I love it. It's family. It's my family. If the RASC ceased to exist, so would I. I don't think I could live without it. But I hate it so much, I love it. And it's, it's so much a part of my life. There's a lot we can explore there. I learned a lot. I, I have to say, I learned a lot about you reading the book. Uh, all kinds of things. For example, you name your telescopes. You've been yeah, doing that do. from the beginning. Uh, why do you do that? Because telescopes are people too. <laughs> <laughs> I named my very first one Echo after the satellite that was launched a few weeks before I got that telescope in 1960. It was a bar mitzvah present, an early bar mitzvah present. And then with each additional telescope over the years, I would give it a name. Typically, it would be a name after some kind of a spacecraft related to the time I got the telescope. Um, but uh, then I started naming them after stars. I named one after the, one of my favorites is named after the asteroid Minerva. And uh, I think the, the first answer was really the one because telescopes are people too. Yeah. They are alive and they have souls. Tell us what happened to Echo. What happened to your first telescope? I still have it. Oh, wow. I still have it, however, I've decided to donate it to the Linda Hall Library of Science, and I'm planning to go there at some time this fall, hopefully to do a book signing. At that point, I will bring Echo right. to the library, and I'm hoping that they'll find a use for it there. But uh, it's still perfectly usable. In fact, it's more usable now than it was that I got it. So there, there, there are a lot of episodes from your childhood and, and uh, you know, young adulthood and so on through the book and your kind of immersion into astronomy. Uh, a lot of interesting details that come about clearly through the fact that you're a diarist as well. You were keeping a journal or keeping a diary for most, most of your life. I wonder what was it like for you? And of course, I should tell the audience, I mean, there are uh, you know, interesting times, scientific discoveries, but a lot of tough times for you as well, personally. What was it like for you to revisit all of that uh, while, while writing this book? It was tough, uh, especially the, the sadder times I decided partly to write them first to get them out of the way so that I could get to the more fun stuff. But I, I was working on my doctorate when one day Wendy said, David, and that's what she calls me, that's what I call me, she said, David, your next book is going to be your autobiography. And I said, no, oh, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do that. Yes, it is. And you're going to start working on it the day you get your PhD. And I remember in February of 2010, we had written the uh, secretary of the department over at the Hebrew University a letter asking her some detail about printing the thesis and this font and this kind of thing. And she sent an email back. And uh, Wendy read it and she said, David, you better get here. When she says David, then I'd stop what I'm doing and come over. And I said, is it good news? And she said, I rather think so. And uh, 
it was from this lady and she said, congratulations, you are now a PhD. The Senate has approved your thesis, just like that. And so I gave Wendy a hug, went over to my laptop and started my autobiography within about an hour. <laughs> and I've been working on it for about the last nine years. What was a surprise to me, what might be a surprise to people here, is that you start with a suicide attempt. Yeah. I started, there's a Latin phrase, in medias res. I started in the midst of the worst time of my life. And there are some people who really objected to the starting that way, but that's, that's me. That's who I am and who I was and who I am. I've always had a tendency towards depression. It is not something that I'm terribly proud of. But if I had not told my family what I'd done that day, there would be no, no book, and there'd be no uh, me being here, and you wouldn't be here uh, interviewing me. You'd probably be interviewing someone far more interesting, <laughs> but, but you would, uh, it wouldn't be me. And just to clarify, your mother and your brother kind of rescued you by bringing you to the hospital in time. Yeah, mom, mom didn't waste any time. They put me in the car, they got my own younger brother to drive me to the hospital. The next day, when I was coming out of it, a couple of doctors walked in, they asked me how I was doing, and I said, uh, I'm doing a little better. But I said, tell me, how serious was this? And they said, it was damn serious. Another half an hour, there wouldn't have been anything we could have done. It was that close. You had swallowed? Uh, I swallowed a whole bottle of uh, Largactyl right. pills. And I don't know how I managed that. And I also do not remember a thing about that. And this was like 40, 45 years ago. Not a thing. Don't remember doing it. I remember having an argument with the same brother who drove me to the hospital. And then I remember waking up. But that's nothing in between. Absolutely nothing. Right. We know that, you know, there, a lot has been written about, you know, creative people uh, and, you know, sort of... Uh, people who make a big mark in different fields uh, of intellectual pursuit also have these battles at times. I'm wondering now, looking back, to what extent uh, that aspect of your personality, which has been a challenging one for you, how much that has also shaped the way you do your science, the way you do observing, how, how much is that a, a part of you know, the positive side? It has. It has shaped that in many ways particularly as I've just mentioned, because I've always had a tendency towards loneliness and depression. And one of the changes that I made, because the very first draft started with that, with that uh, major attempt, but then I added the two earlier ones right at the beginning, which happened when I was a patient at the Jewish National Home for Asthmatic Children in Denver. And I, was, I had a lot of depression when I was there. And I even quoted from my diary that uh, saying things like my life is over and stuff like that. And but you were, how old were you then? I was 14. 14, right. And, uh, but it's funny, one of the things I was learning as I've gotten older is that the friends that I have made uh, have been uh, ones that have lasted for decades. Young Carl Jorgensen is in the audience somewhere tonight. There you are, Carl, hi. Uh, Isabel Williamson introduced us just after I got back from Denver, this first, first night. Young David Levy, that's young Carl Jorgensen. And here we are 50 years later, and we're still good for our best friends. That's Peter Jedeke, he and I became friends a few months after my d divorce from my, as I call her, my practice wife. And, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, he still puts up with me occasionally. The, the, the time you spent in Denver, this is interesting. So this must have been very difficult for your family because you suffered from asthma, pretty serious. Yeah. And it was, I guess, doctors determined that uh, it would be best for you to go to this place. Like literally, you were like a border. Uh, like, but for, like you grew up in Montreal, but this is to go all the way to Denver. And you were there for how long? Uh, 14 months. 14 months, so away from your family. Yeah, I remember waking up one morning, second day of Rosh Hashanah in 1961, and 
being kind of having difficulty breathing. My brother, my mom came in and I said, you know, I'm having an asthma attack. And she said, well, get over it and get dressed. You are going to school. And about 10 minutes later, my brother walked in and I was in status asthmaticus. I couldn't breathe. I was sitting there gasping for a little breath. And Jerry went out and said, Mom, he ain't going anywhere except to the hospital, which is what happened. Right. I went there, and that's when our allergist suggested that I would be a good candidate to be a patient at the Jewish National Home for Asthmatic Children. And then they accepted me, and I went there the following year. And I stayed there for 14 months. It was a very difficult time. I loved the place. I loved the treatment. But after about a year of that, I got very lonely and very homesick, and I really wanted to go back home again. And tough for your family, too, I imagine, to have you away. I, I didn't realize how tough it was for Dad. But I remember one day talking with them and arguing with my father, and I looked at Dad and I said, I can't wait to get to Denver. And Dad just looked down at the floor and sulked. Oh, how I wish I, he were here so I could apologize for saying that to him. It was a very emotional moment. I had no idea how he did not want me to go there. What opened the door for you to the sky? How did that come in? Well, there was a bicycle accident, which was the thing that really did it. I was riding to my bike to our sixth day, sixth grade class picnic and graduation. And as I'm going, on the bicycle, I'm turning in Montreal onto Victoria Avenue, and I'm turning onto the boulevard, I think some of you know that. And there was this curb coming up, and the bicycle stopped. I didn't, I went sailing over the top of the bike and landed on my arm. And uh, I'm sitting there on the side of the road, wondering, wondering how I'm gonna get through the rest of the day with this arm and all bruised up. And uh, another kid came along and asked, can I help you with something? And I said, yeah, I'm a little bit injured. If you could lift up my bike, and we will walk to school together. And as I stood up, my arm had this new joint between here and here. <coughs> and the pain was excruciating. And I said, I'm not going to school. I'm going to stay here. I'd like you to go to the next block and tell that policeman to come here. The cop must have flown down the block because he was there within a minute. And he didn't care about the arm, but he noticed bruises on my head. And he asked me what I had for breakfast. Another cop came and he asked me what I had for breakfast. <laughs> and finally, I was so tired of telling everybody what I had for breakfast. I could have said anything. It would have worked out right. <coughs> they called my mom and they didn't want her to get excited. And they didn't want her to get upset. And they said, you know, it's, it's nothing. You know, it's just a, cut, a couple of cuts. And we decided to take him to the children's just to make sure he's OK. And uh, uh, mom said, well, maybe I should just wait at home till you bring him back. He, oh, no, 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 you go to the hospital. He, I think he'd like to see you, but he's going to be fine. The school principal had no such qualms about telling dad, Mr. Levy, your son, David, has been seriously injured in a bicycle ac accident. Get down to the children's as soon as you can. <laughs> oh my gosh. My father comes in, he sees me sitting up, and he has this big smile on his face. And it's oh, such a big smile, I got angry at him. I said, I'm hurt, what are you smiling for? And he said, well, I'm smiling because you're going to be fine. And that's what I wanted to see. And then mom comes in expecting me to be that way, and she sees the sling in the cast, and he gets very upset. She was not happy about that. <clears throat> but, but, and, and how oh, yeah. does that lead to astronomy? <laughs> well, that led to astronomy, <laughs> thus. A, a cousin of mine gave me a book called Our Sun and the Worlds Around It. I read it from page one to page 42. I read it again, uh -huh. third time, fourth time, a hundredth time. And I thought, this is what I want to do. And for all those reasons that I've already explained, the fact that the stars could be my friends, they'll never argue with me, they'll never tell me that I can't do this or that or the other thing, mm -hmm. they'll always be fair. And uh, by the middle of that summer, I was hooked. 
And as I'm looking across at you, there's another good friend that I'm looking at, Randy over there, who is running this whole GA, hopefully, hopefully not into the ground, but hopefully it will be a great success. And judging from what the conversations I've had with many of you today, I think it is so far. But anyway, Randy, you remember that uh, I bumped into you that day at White Sands in New Mexico when we were both watching the shuttle Columbia landing on its third landing during that humongous windstorm. And uh, here I get off the bus to, to watch, and it's Randy Atwood just there. You're from Canada. What are you doing here? Watching the shuttle just like you are. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was great. And about 30 miles away, a young teacher named Wendy Wallach was also watching the shuttle and not seeing it land because of the terrible windstorm that day. That was years and years before we finally met. Wow. So the book was a starting point, but you were obviously not an armchair astronomer. So how did you know what to do when you went outside? Or what, was, how, how did you, what guided you to, to become kind of the patient observer that you are? First, I'm not all that patient. Second, <laughs> sky and telescope. Who here subscribes to Sky and Telescope? Who here does not subscribe to Sky and Telescope? That's better, okay. <clears throat> um, Sky and Telescope started coming. I have my first issue from March, the f March 1963, and it's priceless. And uh, years ago, I got, you know, I got a whole bunch of extra copies dating all the way back to the 30s, but when the sky and the telescope were separate publications. Right. Some of you might remember there was a letter from a guy in England about a year ago saying he's doing some research in the history of sky and telescope, and does anyone have a complete set? I wrote, and I said, I happen to have a complete set, and he liked that idea, and I packed it up, and I sent it to him. And uh, I still have a second complete set of most of it, which I haven't given away yet, but uh, I still use it from time to time, and it's nice to have the real issues there, especially the old ones, uh, where you, you have to be careful, otherwise the ink will come off. But uh, they tell you so much, they explain so much. You read about the Milky Way by Bart Bach, you read about galaxies, an article written by Harlow Shapley. I mean, they had the best in the world writing for them at the time. Um, the, the RASC figures in to the story as well. It does. Uh, and, uh, and kind of beginning to be part of that community. But, you know, and this probably won't come as a surprise to uh, seasoned members of the society. There's also, at that point, not only were you introduced to sort of the astronomical community, but also to astronomical politics. Astro so, politics. Yeah, astropolitics. So, so, you know, you're, you're uh, probably among the few in this room to have discovered a number of comets, but you're also probably one of the few to have, uh, you know, uh, graffitied an observatory uh, 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 and among other, other episodes that are uh, in the book. Can, I, I, I don't want to go through the whole story, but you definitely got into, uh, to, there was the observatory crisis chapter. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wonder, looking back at that now, uh, and I think this is something, mem what, what do you take away from that now? You know, sort of in the, in the hindsight of, of maturity, uh, what was going on with you when, when you're kind of having those, uh, those tense moments with other members? Well, it, it actually started, I'm gonna try to make this part of the story as quick as I can. Um, and uh, if the society wishes to expel me again after I'm done, then- uh, Oh yeah, you're probably, the, has anyone else here been expelled from the Royal Astronomical Society? Oh, how many, lots of you, okay, well, <laughs> you can have like a separate little group after, anyway, so that also happened to you. Isabel Williamson, who was, was the foremost observer of her time, thought that I was a young upstart and I was a little bit too hot for, for my own good. And I was too ambitious and too hot-tempered for my own good. And it reached a, the first thing happened when I was 12, and I asked her one night if I could bring a telescope to a star night, which they had. And she said, no. And I thought to myself, no, just no. And I said, well, okay, well, if I come to the star night, would I be able to assist one of the telescope operators? because I do think I could be helpful and I would like to help. 
And she looked at me and she glared at me and she said, we don't let people join until they're 16 and we have a reason for that. Either come as a guest or don't come. And I'm standing there staring at her, resolving to give up astronomy and uh, swearing under my breath and being really upset. I'm glad I didn't keep that thought very long. But then about five years later, things got a little rough. I was in McGill. I was uh, flunking out, doing very badly. And I came in one Friday night and noticed that the old antique paragraph wasn't working. And I did what uh, you should do. You probably needs winding. So I wound it. But it was already wound to the top. So I let it go. And the next day, I told Miss Williamson about it. Anyway, by the end of that evening, she ordered me to leave the building. And uh, I left. And uh, feeling not all very good about myself or about the society or about her. And then uh, in between that and the next one, I was at our cottage having a wonderful observing session and deciding I'm going back to the observatory and uh, everything's going to be fine again. I apologize and be nice and everything. I got back there and within 10 minutes, they were demanding that I leave again. And uh, this time I didn't. In fact, at one time I did and I called Carl and I told him what was happening. He said, pick me up right away and take me over there, which I did. He didn't want to miss this. And uh, <laughs> Great moments in Canadian astronomy history. <laughs> but it was almost as if the older members, of which I am one now, were having this game. Who could be meanest to David? And one person said, you have 30 minutes to get out of here because you're expelled from the society. And then one minute later, he said, you have 29 minutes to get out of here. And I'm thinking, well, someone's watch works. <laughs> and uh, finally, Miss Williamson grabs one side of the chair I'm, not, I'm sitting on. Charles Good grabs the other. They pushed me over, and I fell onto the floor. And I stood up. Carl gets his coat on and says, David, we get out of here before they beat you up. <clears throat> and so I left. And he left. and. Uh, they had a board meeting the following night where one of the older members said, well, let's just send the letter to the national office and be done with it. And it would have been done with it. But the president at the time, Dr. Jean-Pierre Jean, said that, no, we have to do this properly. This is an illegal meeting. We're going to have a proper meeting, and we're going to discuss it like human beings. And uh, we're going to decide what to do. But we're not doing it tonight. They had that meeting about a week later. There was really no other sense to have me expelled from the society. <clears throat> but at the end of that, Ms. Williamson spoke to one of the younger members that she really admired, Jim Lowe, who has sadly passed away. And she said, I need an honest answer from you. Did I really blow it with David? And Jim looked at her and said, Ms. Williamson, David is hot-tempered. He, he's had a big mouth, he talks without thinking, and he really needs to be put in his place. And it's, it's a post part. Yeah, yeah, this is great. And then he said, but he's also the most enthusiastic member we got. And you don't want to be throwing him out of the society. And so she didn't say anything at the time. And about years later, I had uh, gotten my undergraduate degree at Acadia. I was then now at Queens getting my master's degree, and I just got this idea, well, I'm going to write her. Just to say, how are you doing? She'll never answer me. She'll burn the letter. And uh, so I did. I wrote her. And would you believe about a week later I got a response? <clears throat> and considering this is the Canadian Postal Service, <laughs> she must have answered it the same minute she got it. And uh, she told me what she was up to. And she said at the end of the letter, David, the next time you come to Montreal, I should like you to visit me. It turned out I was going to be in Montreal in about a week after that. So I wrote her back. We set up a time. We had a very nice visit. At the end, she said, I want you to visit me every time you come to Montreal. Please promise me that. And I said, I will. And we never were friends when I was young. But boy, we became good friends after that. And when Miss Williamson passed away in the year 2000, 
Uh, I happened to be in Montreal at the time, so I made it to the funeral service. And then as the uh, service was ending, the family came up to me and they said, there are a number of people from the Montreal Center here. And I said, yeah, there are a few. But I wasn't sitting next to the members of the center. I was sitting by myself because I'd come in a little late. And Constantine Papa Cosmos was also there. And they found him and they said, Miss Williamson would have liked you and Constantine to come to the gravesite with the family. So please get in the car and come with us. Boy, was that something else. I got to say goodbye to a good friend and someone we were very, someone I grew very fond of despite everything. So I'm glad it happened in a way. Yeah. It was an important part of my, very important part of my life. Uh, one of the editors of my book advised me to take that whole section out, but it is part of what I've done, part of my life. And so it, it's in here. And uh, so now you know the story, at least a good part of the story. When you were a young person at that time, especially when you were starting out at McGill, did you imagine, especially such an avid observer, and you know, I think even your family was thinking, hey, astronomy shouldn't be everything in life, and you were basically saying, it's pretty much everything in life. D did you imagine you were going to be a professional astronomer then? Yeah. I wanted to be a professional astronomer, like... Uh, like Don McCray or... Like Don you know, McCray. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I knew yeah. Don McCray, yeah. too. Yeah. And like John Percy. I wanted to be like John Percy. Boy, I wanted to be like all the professionals. Who doesn't astronomers. want to be like John Percy? <laughs> oh, seriously. <laughs> Where is John? Is John here tonight? He's, uh, he's going to be here tomorrow, I think. I wanted to be national president of the RASC so that someone would say, I challenge the chair. So that I could say, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what happens next. <laughs> I wanted to be a professional astronomer. But I flunked out of McGill. I couldn't do the math. I couldn't do the physics. I loved physics. I still do love physics, but I couldn't do it. So I flunked out of McGill. <clears throat> the second year, there was a reprise of the observatory thing where, where I went there and participated in this uh, graffiti thing, which I really regret. And if you want to expel me, I will accept that punishment. But I was talking with Randall Rosenfeld about that a number of years ago. And he obviously got the idea that I'm still feeling pretty damn lousy about that event. As young as I was, it was still wrong to do. Of course it was wrong to do. And he said, well, you're going to be punished for it. And I said, OK, what do I do? He said, you are going to recreate the graffiti. I want you to do a drawing of the observatory wall and the graffiti that you did on it. And that's going to be one of the pictures in your book. And that's your punishment. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's fair enough. I spent, a, I spent about 10 times longer doing that than I did the original, the original thing. But the original thing I actually had very little to do with. A friend of mine, who I better not mention his name because he does live in Toronto, but he's not here. Anyway, he did most of it, but it terrified me that they might figure out it was me. So I went back in the middle of the night with the spray paint can by cab. And I studied what I had done, and I redid it from ugly graffiti to drawings of the planets with Saturn's rings and things like that. I spent a ton of time on it. But the whole building is gone now, so I guess it doesn't matter. But, uh, but that, that was that. Right. Your path took you into, you know, you, um, your master's in English, and, you know, as you say now, the, the PhD dissertation. So the other part of your life, apart from observing, is writing. You've written extensively a number of books before this book. What part, where does writing come in in terms of how the role it plays in your creative life? And, uh, you know, so what, what, what dimension does that add to you, to, to what you do? In 1959, I was a camper at a day camp in Montreal called the Lord Reading Yacht Club. There was a counselor I had named Derek. And he and I would sit down and talk. It wasn't that heavy a schedule, so we had a lot of time to do that. And I told him I wanted to talk about something I called authorism. What is authorism, he asked me. I said, authorism means writing a book and reading a book. It, it means living a book. And then a few weeks later, near the end of the season, he came up to me as I was doing something else. He said, David, let's talk. And I said, sure. I was, I was then only 12, 
or 11 or something, and he said, uh, I said, well, would you like to talk about it? And he looked at me and he said, authorism. So I started writing my first book when I was in seventh grade. It was a dreadful book. So I wrote a second one, which was a little bit better, which is, which is much better, which uh, I finished when I was at the Adirondack Science Camp, where we have our retreat now. And uh, then I stopped writing while I was in college, or at least I stopped writing astronomy things while I was in college. And I remember reading uh, Shakespeare and getting involved in Shakespeare, and I can tell you now that if I hadn't inherited my dad's love of Shakespeare, he would have disowned me, taken me out of the will. Huh. Get out of the house, make your own living. Because he loved Shakespeare, and he wanted me to love it too, and I did. And I wrote, I, I remember reading in King Lear, these late eclipses in the sun, moon, sun and moon pretend no good to us and taking my pen and making a mark on the margin that these are astronomical quotes and very good ones and doing absolutely nothing with them, buckus with them, nothing at all. And uh, then came April of 1976. I was about to begin my practice marriage. We were at the Montreal Center observing the, you know what it is, the Lyrids. Meteors, and there were a few meteors, it wasn't very many. Those were the days when Montreal had some clear skies from time to time. And uh, I enjoyed watching them. But as I was watching them, I was wondering, I wonder how many ancient people from history, I wonder if Julius Caesar was a, looked up at the night sky and wondered. And then I looked at the field that I was going to go into. I wonder if Shakespeare looked up and wondered at the night sky. It turned out he did very much. I wonder if other people did, like Gerard Manley Hopkins, like Tennyson, like Yeats. I wonder if these people looked up at the night sky and felt the magic as I do. And that night got me started in connecting astronomy with literature. It got me going on to what eventually became my PhD thesis. and. Uh, it got, me, it got me in this whole new field that I really have enjoyed being with as much as I enjoy observing. What piece of writing are you happiest about? What gave you the most joy to write? After I finished my thesis, I tried to do a book called The Starlight Night, and it was just astronomical references in the writings of Shakespeare, Tennyson, and Gerard Manley Hopkins. That's my favorite book. Between you and me, but don't tell anybody. I'm hoping this will be. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a shot at it. But David, do you think it's inevitable that you would have become a watcher of the sky, the night watchman, or was it, was it kind of a random path? I think it was inevitable. I don't think there's, I don't think I would, I couldn't live if, if you mean if, uh, if President Trump passed an executive order saying you're not allowed <laughs> to observe the sky? Well, I mean, do I you... I couldn't live. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't be around. I, I mean, do you... Well, I guess what I mean is, uh, do you think that, you know, if you had been born at a different time or other interests had crossed your path, that you might have been led in a different direction? Or is there something in the sky that you think that is just... You, you would have found you no matter what? I think it would have found me no matter what, because... One of the things that I love about this guy, and I think most of you love about this guy, is that it is timeless. Whether we're living now with CCDs, and I know if Shakespeare is sitting in the back, if he's come back after 400 years, he would want to learn about, P about CCDs. He would say, get off this bit about your life. Let's talk about CCDs. I don't want to write plays. I want to use a CCD and take pictures of comets. But... Uh, no matter what time I would have been around, there would have been a sky to see. And even though I have a lot of telescopes and the RASC is going to be getting one eventually, um, my favorite sessions are when I just go outside and sit on a chair and I look out for meteors, shooting stars. That's my first night observing session. Session number one was seeing a meteor on July the 4th, 1956. It was just there. And then it wasn't. And you don't need a telescope. In fact, there's a law you can't use a telescope to see meteors, but that's not true. I've seen plenty of meteors through my telescopes. 
But you don't need a telescope to see meteors. It's just fun to do and fun to watch. You don't even need to count them, but it's fun. So in a moment, we're going to ask you to do some readings from the book, and I think we're going to also ask for questions. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions that people want to ask more about different details of, of the work you've done. Just before we go to the readings, uh, I'm sure other people are thinking about this too. As time goes on, if you just think about the difference in what we know about comets when you started in 65 to what we know now, uh, you know, having seen probes landing on comets, other probes smashing into comets, seeing close-ups of comet nuclei, and also all of the electronic searching that goes on around the world 24-7, detecting uh, you know, near-Earth objects and comets and asteroids and so on. Is there still room for the, the David Levy's of the world, the individual human observers? You bet your boots there is. <laughs> There's plenty of room for those of us that just like to look up and to enjoy the night sky and to be one with it. That's what the sky is meant for. It offers us a difference. It offers us something, an ex ex something different from the nightly news where everything's a panic and happens and the next day is forgotten. It offers permanence. It offers something that is beautiful and that is priceless and that is worth getting expelled from the area <laughs> All right, I'll let you read something okay, for us. Okay, I have a couple of uh, passages I'd like to read, a short one and a longer one. The short one is on page five. My first memory at age three in 1951 was almost getting run over by a car. I was visiting a neighbor who lived across the street. As I was crossing Roslyn Avenue to get there, a car roared up and stopped barely in time to avoid hitting me. This memory is vague, but it still resurfaces from time to time. Had it been successful that day, this book would be shorter. <laughs> and uh, the second one is going to be the ending. Since, since this is a nonfiction book, I'm really not giving anything away in the plot by reading the ending of the book. But a lot of you have heard me give a presentation where I show slides done to music. Especially those of you in the Montreal Center have heard that. And, and, and I, I gave a talk at, at, at the uh, OSC once. And did I that. remember. And, uh, um, but one of these that I give is it done to um, The Lady in Red, which is a, a beautiful, beautiful song written by the British composer Christa Berg. And in it, I show the pictures of Comet Shoemaker Levy 9. And on this day, was April 2017. It was at a conference on astronomy in Brazil, in Campos dos Goitazazes, a medium-sized city in southern Brazil. Nearing the end of my lecture, I began to show the audience a selection of images of Comet SL9 and its impact with Jupiter in 1994. As the images began to display, so did the music, Christa Berg's classic love song, The Lady in Red. As the music grew louder, I was concentrating on making sure that the images marched along in correct order and time. There was some noise in the audience, but I kept my concentration on the images and the music. Then Patrick, the translator, approached me. David, he said, I think you'd better look at the audience. I turned about and saw a startling sight. At least 25 of the younger audience members had turned on the flashlights on their cell phones and were waving them about the, the hall in time to the music. The effect of the beams of light shining through the big room was like a cosmic dance. For a few seconds, I stared in wonder. Then I turned back to the images, but I then looked again and again. The dance went on until the music ended. I have given this presentation many times. The reactions are usually good, but never did I experience anything like this. I felt like a performer at a rock concert. It was unique and overwhelming. I felt as though what I had done in my life was not worth it. In a sense, the years of insecurity, poverty, and uncertainty were all resolved with the glorious cosmic waltz of lights I witnessed late on a sultry afternoon in Brazil. Thank you very much.
David Levy, family member, RSC member, and sort of extended family member and uh, life member of the RSC. How about some questions? I do have some music first. Oh, you have some music? Oh, of course. Right. Uh, David has some music, music, and then we'll go to questions. questions. So get your questions ready. Yeah, the music has to do with Dad again, because uh, Dad has been gone since 1985, and one of these days I'll get over it, but uh, it's not quite yet. One day in the summer of 1960, Dad and, I, Dad and the family and I were having dinner, and he started to tell a story about a man named Joshua Cole, a young boy whose father was really mean. And he looks at me and he says, I'm mean, but not as mean as this guy was. And I, I, he said this father would try to drown his son in the bathtub. He would be really, really mean to the point that he eventually just got rid of him and sent him away to a boarding school. At the boarding school, his son Joshua met a teacher who was an amateur astronomer, got him interested in astronomy. After he left the school, he got a telescope, and he'd earn a living by standing at railway depots, and as trains would stop and people would get off, he'd charge them a penny to look through the telescope. He made enough money doing this, he was able to get himself a big telescope and an observatory on what he called Spyglass Mountain. One night as he's looking through his telescope, he discovers incontrovertible evidence of life on Mars. At the very moment this Dickensian type novel turns into a real horror story when someone breaks into the building with a gun and tries to kill him. To either steal the telescope or just to kill him. One of the shots gets him and he falls down. He's lying in bed recovering and uh, trying to get his health back when suddenly a friend comes in with a newspaper. Look, something's broken. And in the newspaper is this big headline. American amateur astronomer cites evidence of life on Mars. Young amateur astronomer sighting confirmed by the professionals. Is Mars a living planet? And then daddy says, I remember the last words of this book and I'm gonna tell him now. First to report discovery, coal of spyglass mountain famous in a night. Well, as dad got older, every now and then he'd ask me if I had, could get him a copy of Coal of Spyglass Mountain, and I never really could. And, uh, well, I guess maybe we're not gonna show the music. Let's see here. No, I guess we're not. I guess we're not. Uh, I guess, no, I, that was like a toss up, but it was, a thing <coughs> and uh, maybe, we can, maybe we can bring it so is it an audio uh, thing no it don't don't worry about it Randy, Randy sure. it's fine yeah it's fine did it I think it's trying to be on there, we there we go there we go well let's see okay Anyway, well, not yet. No, 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 yeah, not yet. Sorry. <laughs> it's not the council meeting. <laughs> anyway, uh, in 1995, I gave a lecture to a big group, and they had hired a pianist, a blind pianist named Ken Miedema, to write a song based on Coal of Spyglass Mountain, because the night that I first showed my mom and my dad Jupiter was in September of 1960, and there was a theory at the time, not at that time, but after SL9, that 1960 might have been the year that Comet Shoemaker Levy 9, years from being discovered, turned out to be um, the year that it got captured by Jupiter's gravity and started to orbit Jupiter instead of the sun. And uh, I described this like the comet as a sailing ship moving through the sky, moving around Jupiter, and finally coming home. Not so much that it collided with Jupiter, but that it came home and docked at Jupiter. Slightly different 
way of describing the events. And I'd like, if I can get this to work, I would like to see if I can play this for you now. Right in the middle, I think, uh, bottom middle is the play button. I'm not sure we're going to get this, but... Uh, Maybe, what if we try that one? Uh, well, we could see that. It doesn't look like we're getting it. Oh, here it is. Oh, daddy, come look at the evening sky. The edge of tomorrow's dawn. It's four billion years old. It's a mighty ship that goes sailing on and on. Daddy, come look at the evening sky For the wonders yet to come And we'll follow the course of the great sailing ship Till the ship comes sailing home Daddy, come look in the evening sky At the end of tomorrow's dawn It's four billion years old It's a mighty ship And it goes sailing on and on And Daddy, come look in the evening sky For the wonders yet to come And we'll follow the course Of that great sailing ship Till the ship comes sailing And that's it. Now we can have some questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. I know there's a microphone over there. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if someone on this side has a question. It means you might have a bit of a walk. But yeah. So here we go. But we do want to, uh, uh, we want to have you come up to the microphone just so people can hear the question as well. Any questions? I've got lots more. Any questions? But we didn't do that good a job. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. So let's hear it in the microphone. Well, it happened just about last week. I came back from Acadia, where I had been awarded the Distinguished Alumni Award. Uh, I don't know, I guess they give one to a real old graduate, that was me, they give one to a real young graduate who still has a future, and uh, I was the old one. And uh, that was a lot of fun, I really did enjoy that. But the interesting thing about it is that just before leaving to the GA, I got a letter from the Premier of Nova Scotia, of all people, congratulating me on the award. And I knew it wasn't a form letter. I, I, politicians never write anything other than form letters. But this wasn't because he mentioned astronomy in there, my work in astronomy and in science. I was amazed. I couldn't believe it. And that is something, if I weren't finished yet, I'd want to put in. Good question. Excellent. Very Thank good you. question. Thank you. Couple more. Thanks for coming and Thank doing you. this. Um, kind of a question about looking for comets. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Pelche and his effect on you. Leslie Pelche, right? Yeah. And uh, maybe some other Canadian uh, comet hunters that you, you know. Um, I can think of two or three. Um, but also, second question is, when you started looking for comets, there weren't automated systems grabbing comets fainter than you could even probably see with your telescope. So all of, so what, how do you feel about the whole hobby of comet hunting sort of being extinct? Well, does the audience have another four hours so I can answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. I'll do the best I can as quickly as I can, but that's a good, very powerful question. 
The first one part is that when I started to search for comets, I hadn't read Starlight Nights yet. And uh, I shouldn't be mentioning Starlight Nights because I do want to stay married to Wendy. And uh, she has asked me that she said, you're here to promote your book, not Leslie's. But I've always said that if I'm on a desert island and the ship is sinking and Captain Smith is jumping off and everything, and uh, they said, the only thing we have on this ship is a library containing every book ever written. And each of you can take one book to be on the desert island for the rest of your lives. The book I'd take would be Starlight Nights. I read that book as a project to do a book review in grade 10. And I was late at night, I was lying in bed, and I thought, I'll read till I fall asleep. Page one, page 268, I couldn't put it down. God, that was wonderful. The best line in it about variable stars is the reason that I went into variable stars, he wrote, was that stars are just there, but variable stars are happening. And that had a, was a very powerful influence on me. He also wrote about comets and the discovery of his first comet and how emotional it was for him and uh, how he talks about to hunt a speck of moving haze. But that book had an enormously powerful influence on me. But uh, those were back in the days, as you say, in your second question, that comet hunting, anybody could do it. I would not recommend comet hunting now to anybody starting it visually. I know of one visual, two visual discoverers who are still finding comets. I found one visually in 2006. Don't know how I did that, but I did, and I was jumping up and down for about a week on that. And Don Mockholtz found one a few months ago. Boy, I was happy. I'm so happy for him. But uh, if, you, if you want to search for comets now, you need a big telescope, a lot of money, you need to be one of the people who was here earlier today saying that we have a lot of money to build lots of telescopes and the program's called this and that, and it's wonderful, but we need $18 trillion to do it, and I'm collecting at the door. But um, that's not how I do my observing. I do it just because I love it. I still go out searching. I still do it the way with the billions of dollars, although I borrow telescopes from people who do have the telescopes. And I still use my own telescope to do f visual observing. I don't expect ever I'll find a comet again. But it's the search that's important to me. That's what's so much fun. I hope I did OK answering your question. Thank you. Yes. David, great to see you again. Known you since 1977 back in Montreal. My question comes back to SL9, the discovery. I've heard stories, not true that the plates that were used that night were damaged and it was a semi-cloudy night. Was that true? And, and if so, imagine the fate that if those plates weren't damaged and it was a cloudy night, you probably would have never found it. True and true. Good question. Uh, we were taking pictures that night. The first night was pretty clear. We're taking pictures, and uh, Jean, of course, starts developing the first set, and suddenly she say, he says, stop observing and come down here. So we stopped. Said, Just drop what you're doing and come down here. So we stopped. The telescope was in the middle of his exposure. And he said, you're not going to believe this, but someone opened the film box. The films are black. They are all light struck. Words were spoken. <coughs> We were, he was pretty sure he knew who did it. And uh, we were standing there around wondering, you know, we, were, we had started to hypersensitize a new batch, but that was still six hours away. And it was a clear night, and the forecast was horrible for that, the rest of that observing run. And so we're out there, and Jean decides to develop some of the films about halfway down the box. And they came out pretty well. The edges were were light struck, but the middles were okay. So I said, I think we can continue using these bad films. And we got through our first night that way. The second night, we had good films where everything's going fine, we're all happy, clouds over. Big clouds with a 
threatening storm and people yelling and Thor screaming at each other and that stuff. And the RASC having another business meeting. And we go outside and we stop observing again. And I said, uh, it's not really too bad. You know, there's clear sky over there. <laughs> Two of them just crack up. They said, that's our optimistic, naive friend here. He'll observe through anything. He said, David, it costs us $4 every time we slap a film into that telescope. We cannot afford to be doing observing on a night like this. And I said, $4, that's not too bad. He said, that's for American dollars. <laughs> <laughs> not that toy money you guys play with. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, by this time, Carolyn's looking up and he says, she says, you know, Gene, the sky is looking better. And Jean looked, and I looked, and Carolyn looked, and Jean said, let's do it. And we started using those bad films. There were still quite a few of those bad films left. The first film we took was the first of the two discovery pictures of SL9. Wow. On that mostly cloudy night, we had to wait an hour and 47 minutes, approximately, before we could take the second picture of that field. And I remember thinking, boy, I, sure, I can barely see the guide star that is so bad. And when, not because of the clouds, because Jupiter was so close. And uh, we're, we're looking through the field, we're looking through the eyepiece, I could barely see it, but I managed to guide it all right. And then the next day I told you about what happened. Uh, I, just a quick follow-up to this. When you were talking earlier about that initial discovery or that initial detection of that image, there was a sense, as you say, of seeing, you'd never seen anything like it before. Carolyn said it was a, a squashed comet. And then Jim Scotty was able to, to follow up and confirm. But at what point was it apparent what it was that you were seeing? At what point did it become apparent that, oh, this is a, like a fragmented body? When did that become a... Well, that was Gene's idea. That's a good uh -huh. question. That was Gene's idea. As we're going home for dinner that night, and of course this newly discovered comet is what we're really... I mean, Jim hadn't even called us back yet. And Gene said, what if this comet physically is close to Jupiter, not just line of sight? And what if this comet had some kind of catastrophic disruption recently that tore it apart? Turned out Gene was 100% right about that. And he got that part right. And uh, that was, I think, you know, I, I miss Gene a lot, but he sure had a good life. And uh, I remember we're sitting at one of the NASA press conferences and Gene's sitting there and Carolyn and I'm sitting there. One of the reporters says, okay, Gene, explain it all to us. That's your question. <laughs> they trusted him, they loved him. I mean, he was very popular with the media and uh, we had a good time that week. It was, it was really something special. It's amazing. One more question. question. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to visit the ruins of the old Spring Hill Meteor Observatory outside of Ottawa. And that experience makes me ask this question. You've, you've been telling us about some of your bittersweet experiences. Could you please tell us a story about a bittersweet story about a derelict observatory or a derelict telescope that you've been associated with? Please, Good question, thank you. In fact, the story I'd like to tell you to answer your question has to do with the Spring Hill Meteor Observatory. We were there one night in uh, 1970, uh, and uh, the Ottawa Centre people are all in these coffins, which were designed to keep meteor observers warm on cold nights. <laughs> this yeah. was in August, and it was not a cold night. And <laughs> about the heat and wishing they put air conditioners in these things, air conditioners or something. And uh, they went all right. But one of the people that night who was observing was Rolf Meyer. And he, he, was, he would later become famous himself as a comet discoverer. He was the first person to discover a comet from Canadian soil. And he won the Chet Medal of the RASC for that. And I was so proud of him, but I didn't know Rolf that well. And I thought, you know, he's going to go along with his life and I'm going to go along with my life, but uh, I'm never going to get to know Rolf. And then the next year uh, happened and after that, and by then I was, I'd already moved to Arizona. And I was having dinner at the Ottawa Center. 
I had there, there to attend another talk, and Rolf was there, and Rolf came to the dinner afterwards. And Peter Chedeke from London was there with, with Diane. And uh, Peter starts asking about the Christmas trip that he and Diane are planning to visit me. In Tucson, we're making plans and things like that. And Rolf is listening with, with one ear. And suddenly he turns and says, David, I said, yeah. And then that way he had, he said, can I come to visit you too at Christmas? I couldn't believe it. I said, of course, I'd love it if you'd come. And he came. Hmm. And then we became, from that moment on, we were good friends. And so that was, that was a good story that I had about the Spring Hill Meteor Observatory. Excellent. Good question. One more question. Hi, David. Um, I have a question for you from my daughter. Um, as you know, since you've written so many books, we even have a dedicated David Levy shelf in the Montreal Library. And she was wondering how you know when you have an idea that needs to be put down on paper. Where does that connection happen? I really, that's a very profound question that she asked. Please let her know that. But I really can't answer it. It just happens. I get an idea that I might like to do something, I have a project, and uh, the, 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 the idea that came to this one was finding a publisher. Because, you know, once I got started, I wrote a proposal for it and sent it to multiple publishers all over the United States and Canada, and they all said, it's a nice idea, but we're not interested. We're not interested. We're not, it's like an echo. And, uh, that was that, and Wendy said, don't worry about it, write the book, do, what, do what's in your heart. Eventually, you'll be alive or dead, there will be a publisher. We're not worried about that. And I said, well, I love you, but I don't agree, and I think we need to find a publisher. But I did what she said, and I kept on working on it, and then suddenly, I get this call from Randall Rosenfeld, and Randall says, do you have a publisher for your book? And I said, uh, we're looking around, but not yet. Would you like the RASC to publish your book? Just, just a thought, just a thought to consider. Boy, did I accept that fast. <laughs> I couldn't wait to accept that. I, was, I don't think he was finished the question yet before I said, yes, yes, I want, I'd love it if the RASC would do that. This organization that I love, that has meant so much to me, I couldn't imagine a better publisher. And uh, over the years, I got to meet some wonderful people. Our current national president, for example, who was the chair of the Publications Committee, Charles Ennis, who has written a book. And he called one day, he said, when I really want to talk to someone, I have to call, I can't do email. And he had a very interesting idea. He said, he said, it's a nice book, but I don't like the way it begins, so take out the whole part about the suicide and about the sadness and just the astronomy, shorten it by about 50%. And Wendy's kind of listening. <laughs> She's shaking her head and stomping around the room. And I said, these are good ideas, but this is my life. I didn't really know how to respond. This is my life. This is the story of me. This is who I am. And Charles said, I get it. It is. Don't change it. We'll change the little things, but we'll leave this structure as it is. And uh, since then, the suggestions that people have co had come with gotten better and better and better. And I hope to heck I've answered her question now. <laughs> there you go. And a great way to wrap up the story of David Levy. Yours now. I just <laughs> That's okay. It's just comment stuff. Uh, all right, have a great night, and I'm sure David will be here uh, for, for more one-on-one -on -one as well, and great to see you all. Thanks. <clears throat> Let me, uh, Ivan, on behalf of everyone here, thank you for coming and hosting this and uh, really diving deep into, uh, into some aspects of the book. And again, David, thank you very much.